Okay, hello, welcome to video number two of the CS Controls version 7.1 tutorial. We're going to be discussing inventory control and hardware assets. As with all our videos, I have to give you the uh, disclaimers about these videos. Some of the material that is covered will be considered uh, pen testing tools um, or white hat tools, and I want to make sure that all of you use those, the knowledge that you're going to gain from these videos appropriately, and please do not. Uh, misuse it. Um, you are responsible for your own actions, obviously. Um, and again, this channel is purely for educational purposes. We do not warrant that this information is complete by any means. And please, in the comments section, please do post any corrections, ideas, uh, comments. Um, I myself am huge on learning, being a constant learner. So if I make a mistake, please call me out on it. That's how I'm going to learn. If you don't call me out, I will not know. So um, I actually love it when people do correct me on things and educate me, and I love to educate them. So with that said, let's get going. So basic module one, we're talking about inventory controls for hardware assets. So what are hardware assets? Hardware assets in this case could mean your desktop computer, could mean your tablet, Android-based, could mean your tablet PC, it might also mean your voice over IP equipment, your, your Cisco phone um, or other type of voice IP uh, enabled device. Essentially, we're looking at things that have IP addresses, so your standard laptop computer. Some copiers today are, a lot of them are internet connected. They are network connected. They have uh, RJ45 connections on the back. They have IP addresses. They can scan, they can fax, they can email from there. Uh, your other tablet, we've got Mac tablets and Android tablets. Um, also, your security cameras. Some people overlook the fact that sometimes security cameras have IP addresses as well. And obviously, any computers you have in the data center, and even sometimes your access points might have IP addresses to themselves. So, when we're looking at this model, we're talking about hardware assets, we're looking at really anything that has an IP address. And we also want to mention the elephant in the room, which is the bring your own device movement, which is pretty normal in a lot of organizations today, um, the ability that users can bring their own device. This opens a whole different can of worms from a security perspective, which we'll discuss in more detail uh, in future videos, but you might want to look at your corporation's policy on bring your own device. So these are the modules that are covered in this basic module one. Control 1.1 is utilize an active discovery tool. 1.2, utilize a passive asset discovery tool. 1.3, use DHCP logging to update inventory assets. Maintain detailed asset inventory. 1.5, maintain asset inventory information. 1.6, address unauthorized assets. 1.7, deploy port level access control. And 1.8, utilize client certificate to authorize hardware assets. Now for the sake of time, this video is only gonna cover modules 1.1 and 1.2. There will be future videos to cover the other modules. Trying to keep these videos under an hour, about maybe 20 to 40 minutes each, um, because I'm pretty much basing this on my classroom teaching experience and people's attention spans and how long, you know, before I need a break. So I'm trying to keep these videos in kind of a more bite size uh, size. Before we go into this, there's an, a concept we have to discuss really quickly called the Open Systems Interconnection Model, or OSI model, as it's commonly known. Now, an easy way to remember the different pieces of this model is by the sentence, and yes, there are other sentences you can use, all people seem to need data processing. Now, before I go into it a little bit more, I'll give it a little brief history of it. It was developed by major computer and telecommunication companies back in 1983. Um... OSI was originally intended to be a detailed specification of actual interfaces, um, but the makers of the OSI model soon realized that the interfaces that they had in 1983 probably would be much different 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. So instead they said, you know what, we're going to make this a common reference model that others could then use to develop their own detailed interfaces, which in turn would become standards governing the transmission of data packets, which is really what we're dealing with. In 1984, ISO, or the International Organization for Standardization, adopted the OSI model, and today it is 
essentially internationally recognized as a transmission of data uh, model. Now on the very top level of the OSI model, we have what's called the host layers and the media layers. And these layers are then broken up into sub-layers. The, the phrase you saw in the beginning, all people seem to need data processing, is how you're going to remember the different layers. There's application, all, presentation, people, session, seem, to, transport, need, network, data, data link, and processing physical. Here you can kind of see kind of what each of the layers are responsible for. Now why is this significant for asset inventory, you might be asking. The reason is that a lot of the tools you see involved in active um, asset inventorying, they're going to say this is a layer two or whatever layer it might be running on or interacting with kind of helps you out. It's sometimes useful from a troubleshooting perspective. Um, not really going to go into that level of detail in this video, but it's kind of good to know this. Um, how often you're going to use this in the real world, I'm not really sure. It depends on your job function, but it's pretty much the industry accepted that you should at least know what the OSI model is and what the layers are, because it kind of helps when you're talking to people, network people, or um, application developers, so you can kind of tell where things are interacting. If we look a little bit deeper in the OSI model, here you can see an example of the type of actual communication protocols that are occurring. Application layer is usually user input and output. This is very human-oriented, if you will, uh, interface. If you go all the way down to physical, we're talking about DSL, things like that. This is pulses of light or electricity uh, across a line. And then you have everything in between. You've got, for example, in presentation, this is where your encryption and your decryption and your compression is taking place. So if you have a problem in that area, you'll know you're probably at the presentation layer. Again, this is just informative, guys. Um, how much of this information are you going to use on a day-to-day -day basis? Not really sure, but the point of this channel is to educate everyone and kind of help you communicate with different, different uh, technical people at different levels. First, let's talk about utilize an active discovery tool and what this actually means. And to do this, you have to understand the concept of a promiscuous NIC, or network interface card, or promiscuous mode. Now, what does this mean? In a very high level, if you imagine this bar is your network. This is not obviously realistic. This is just to kind of give you guys an idea. You have a few computers on your network. And they're all sitting there talking away. The way that... OSI and communications was designed, the way the whole system was designed way back in the beginning, was that if computer, if the computer at the far left with the kind of light blue line, we'll say I wanted to talk to the purple or the red, it would send a packet with the header saying, hey, I want to talk to the purple line computer or the red line computer. Technically, the yellow, the green, and the, and the lighter blue, excuse the colors, um, computer would also see that packet travel across the network, but they would look at the header and go, oh, this, this packet is not addressed to me. I'm going to discard it. I'm going to ignore it. When it gets to the red or the purple computer, they're going to say, hey, this is for me. I'm going to open it. You can almost imagine packets as little pieces of mail. And again, this video, we're not going to go into the details of, of actual how packets are structured and things like that. But just for now, suffice to say that it has an address. If, that, if it doesn't pertain to a computer's address, the computer will discard the packet, ignore it, and essentially move on with what it was doing. So it's not going to even acknowledge that packet exists. Now, where this would become a problem is that if I'm trying to discover what computers are on your network and I'm discarding packets that are not addressed to me, then I'm going to have a problem. I'm going to see one thing. When your computer is set up with promiscuous mode, it can actually see all the packets. So it's going to collect all the packets. Some types of network discovery tools are based upon, they're going to send a packet to every IP address on the network and wait to see a, a response. Other types of network discovery tools called sniffers um, are going to actually look at the network and collect data as they see it coming through. You can have a, a mix between passive and active um, thing, but suffice it to say you're going to need promiscuous mode to really do an effective network discovery. 
As far as what tools you can use, um, there's a lot on the market. What I'm going to show you now is by far not an exhaustive list. It's just a list of some of the common tools. Nmap or Zenmap, which is the graphical user interface version of Nmap. Nmap by default is a, a command line uh, program. Uh, Wireshark, both of these two are, are free, very widely known. Wireshark is a packet capture, packet generator. It can be used also as part of a network discovery tool. Um, Op Manager, we're starting to get into more and more. You have to pay for these tools. Um, PRTG, again, these are the tools you're going to be paying for. Device 42, SolarWinds, and Observer. Again, not an exhaustive list. There are many other programs out there. Um, I'm not going to tell you use one over the other. As a matter of fact, um, you should really decide about what your budget is, what your needs are, things like that. That should really drive what you should be using. Um, Wireshark and Nmap are free and um, very powerful. They're not as geared towards real. If you've got a, a large enterprise network, they're not really going to help you a lot. Um, Wireshark, for example, is a very common troubleshooting tool. So if you have a problem, a computer is uh, not receiving packets or something's happening, you can use Wireshark to do some more deep dives into what the source of the problem might be. Speaking from personal experience only, I've used SolarWinds, I've used Observer. Um, I think both of them are fantastic tools. Um, but again, I would recommend you get the trial version of the program, test it out on your network, see which one uh, works best for you. Some things you might like want to look for when you're choosing a tool, and again, not an exhaustive list, does it do Wi-Fi? Most of these do. Some may not, but most do. Can it do remote sites or cloud? This may re re need you to put a, a hole in your firewall or virtually speaking to allow the tool to reach out to that remote site or to the cloud provider to scan. By the way, um, before you use one of these tools against your tenant in Amazon Web Services or Azure or Rackspace or whomever you choose, I would definitely talk to your cloud provider first because you don't want to set off any unnecessary alarms within their security system if you're going to be scanning your tenant in the cloud. So you might want to pre-schedule them, hey, I'm doing a network inventory, I need to do a scan on my tenant in the cloud blah blah to to assess the virtual machines over there um, so you know try and keep as many people in the loop that might be affected by this as possible the, none of these tools in the previous slide should ever be just kind of thrown in the network don't take observer or solar winds and just bam you know start start scanning the whole network it can cause a lot of problems graphical user interface or GUI um, this is I've had experiences where people have overlooked this. It sounds kind of silly, but from personal experience, this is a huge piece. This tool, some of these tools cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, depending on how many whistles and bells you add to them. And the likelihood is you're going to be using it pretty often. So it should be comfortable to use. Um, you want to look at the how easy is it to train other people to use it? How does the interface look? Do you like the interface? Um, one thing I usually tell people is try to write yourself a list of the common tasks you see yourself doing when you're doing a network inventory. And then how many steps does it take you within that tool? Is it one step, two steps? Can it be automated? Can the tool support scripting? Um, sometimes if you have to do something very redundant, scripting, if it supports some type of scripting language or it has some proprietary scripting language, huge benefit. Um, how easy is it to update the network map? By this I mean, can the tool actively monitor your network for devices being added or removed? Again, this comes into play especially if you're talking about BYOD, bring your own device. You definitely want to be aware when people are adding devices to your network. You do not want people to just be able to walk on and, and just throw things on your network. That would be very bad. Can the device show connections? Um, by this I mean, can it show, you know, printer A is connected to switch B, which is, you know, connected to router C, things like that. And in that same regard, can it show different types of hardware, you know? 
this is a this is a firewall. Well, what what layer firewall is this? And again, we talked about the OSI model. I'm kind of going a little bit out of scope, but if you guys are interested, I can do another video about firewalls, the different layers of the OSI model they function on. What kind of switch is it? Things like that. Can it identify that? Some tools can, some can't. Can it send you an alert, a text message or an SMS or something um, when a device is added? So you're aware when things are, are being added to your network, they shouldn't be. And most importantly, and we're going to get into this in future slides, any active scanning tool will have an impact on your network. Okay, I don't care if the manufacturer gives you a story that we have very low impact and our tool is all this and that. Um, it will have an impact on your network. None of the tools discussed here are going to be zero impact. I recommend, and again, I'm just leveraging personal experience, get the trial of the tool, get a network monitor running on a separate laptop, but able to see the tool, and then do a test scan on a weekend, preferably weekend. Uh, definitely do this during a time where um, you'll have the least possible impact if a foobar moment happens. Um, never, ever, ever do a test in a production environment. So don't target production servers. Uh, target lower uh, active servers, if at all possible, or, or, or maybe a backup network, things like that, just so you can see what kind of effect it has on your network. And again, many, many other questions you can ask. Um, I would... If when you're looking to acquire one of these tools, I would definitely talk to your, you know, talk to people in your organization, um, talk to the network engineers, talk to the developers, get their feedback, find out what maybe they've used some of these tools, maybe they've had good experiences, maybe they've had bad experiences. Um, I'm not going to tell you myself because the point of this channel is to educate and I don't want to be um, leaning to one tool or the other. Um, this said, if any of the suppliers of network scanning tools would like to send a free copy, be happy to review it because we definitely want to do that. Um, and we would be more than happy to sponsor any of these companies if they want to want to give us a copy of their software to play with. Um, but from your perspective, again, every organization is going to be different. Every network is going to be different, guys. There is not one size fits all. You've got to look at your own organization, your own preferences, what you like to use, what works for you. I'm not going to tell you what to buy. Just um, they're all, all the tools I showed you are great, great tools. Um, here I just wanted to quickly go over network scanner to network monitoring. Essentially, network scanning, think of it as active. You know, it's going to identify a range of IP addresses. Network monitoring is more looking at the network. This is where you're going to do things like baselining or trending the network. Um, what this means is you're going to like look at the network and look at the traffic on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, all the way through the week. Um, network trending, ideally, you want to run it 365. Now, some people I know out there are going to start barking and say, what, are you kidding? I said, ideally, perfect world. The more information you can collect about the network, the more you can understand your traffic, the better you can tune your network. Um, the more you know, depending on what industry you're in, depending on your, your, your backbone of your network, there's so many variables involved, but I personally love data. I love information. The more, the better. Um, I'm most happy in Tableau, or Excel with formulas and analyzing the data and, and doing um, charts and graphs to help extrapolate from that data actionable intelligence. You know, our network is showing latency at this time because of this or that, things like that. Um, so personal philosophy, you cannot have too much information. I think the more, the better. And the goal, but remember, the goal is to understand your network and understand it from a security perspective. So don't just collect data for the sake of collecting data. As far as how some of these tools work, I'm going to start with the most basic and show you two examples. The first is called Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, Echo Request. 
Most people know it just as ping. Super, super simple concept. Computer A is going to send what's called an echo request to computer B. Computer B is going to send an echo response. Essentially, it's like you saying hi to computer B, and computer sa B says hi, and that's it. I mean, that's a ping. Um, if you want to try it, open up a command prompt in your computer, um, and uh, just type in ping, and then you can type in like www microsoft.com or apple.com or anything.com really and you know amazon.com you can do and you will see it's going to give you a series of messages back saying hey you know it replied and it took x amount of ms or milliseconds um, obviously the lower the milliseconds the better the uh, response is now some systems are designed not to respond to ping on purpose so ping is okay but not always going to give you the most accurate picture Another one, a little bit more complicated, is called SNMP, or Simple Network Management Protocol. This is actually a two-piece type of system. You need agents, and then you need the, the um, network management system to read from the agents. Now, most systems today come pre-built, printers, servers, computers, switches do have an SNMP agent available. You just have to turn it on and then you just need the, the um, a compatible format so the monitoring computer can pick it up. It will send an SNMP get and then it will get a response. Usually you're going to get more information from SNMP um, than you would from a ping. Ping is just going to tell you, hey, it took this long for the computer to respond with a hello. SNMP, you're going to get more information, but there's a little bit more setup time required. There are other ways that these active uh, scanners work. Okay, I'm not going to tell you there's only two ways to do it, but I want to keep this video reasonable length, and there's still quite a bit of material I want to cover. So, again, there are other methods. This is just to give you an idea. So when you look at the tool, find out how does it do the discovery. Okay, it's an active tool. What is it doing? What method is it using? to discover hardware on my network, things like that. Now, I gotta emphasize this warning again. Um, active method, it will slow down your network. How long will it slow down your network? I don't know. Could be milliseconds, could be minutes. And again, as noted here, it does require a level of insecurity sometimes. As I said, if you're doing a remote site or a cloud, you're going to need to open up your firewall to allow that tool to get out. So you have your outgoing and your incoming requests of traffic. You know, is this technically a introducing a vulnerability? Yes and no. We could have a discussion, a whole presentation just on this. Um, but just know that it exists. Now, this will be a problem for what's called industrial control systems or ICS. If you are an IT person in an industrial control environment, don't use an active tool. Go for a passive. Very simple. Number 1.2, utilize a passive asset discovery tool. Now, before I jump into this real fast, I also want to tell you is you can use both of these simultaneously too. Some of these tools are active and passive, so be careful. I did want to throw in this great quote I heard years ago from a gentleman named Ram Das, and it is, the, quiet, the quieter you are, the more you hear. And I think it's a wonderful quote um, from pen testing experience. It's, it's amazing because to be good in pen testing, you really need to be very quiet. Um, active tool, loud, noisy, you know, IPS, intrusion prevention system, intrusion detection systems, they will pick up an IPS, uh, a uh, active uh, network inventory tool, absolutely. So two options I want to put out there again, just give you guys an example. P0F is a free, very old, as you can see, command line only tool and passive vulnerability scanner. PVS, as it used to be called a long time ago, is now called Nessus Network Monitor. The way these tools work is they essentially listen to your network. So they, they sit there in promiscuous mode and they just, as packets are zooming by, they're making copies and making notes of the information. As noted before, um, if you have an industrial control system, things are different. Now, full transparency, 
I have been doing this a long time. I've been doing IT for over 20 years. I've never contracted or worked for a company using industrial control systems. So any of you out there who do work with industrial control systems, please you know, throw in some insight in the comments section. I'd love to read it. Um, this is just my two cents in it. Uh, this is called the Purdue model for industrial control systems. Similar to the OSI model, we have six levels, as you can see. Again, I'm a novice. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in this, but I want to kind of put this out there so people can see what it is. These are the different levels of the industrial control system. Um, and a tool used in industrial control systems, I think, is a great tool. Yeah, one of them, again, not exhaustive list, guys, it's called Tripwire Log Center. Super cool tool. What does it do? Number one, puts very little traffic on your network because it is dealing with your log management solution. And it is going to query it. It's going to pull that system or systems on a predefined date and time. So in other words, when things are functioning at their peak, if you have a production schedule and there's a time when production is down or reduced, that's when you can set Log Center to query your, your, your uh, log management solution. So not one thing, not when logs are streaming in uh, extremely quickly, but when they're very low, it takes that data, it collects it and collates it and formats it in a way you can use it. Really cool tool. Again, I'm not being funded by Tripwire. Uh, they're not a sponsor of this channel. Um, if they do want to sponsor, I'd be happy to accept any sponsorship. Uh, but on paper, from what I've read about the tool, it sounds like a really, really great tool. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to admit we're going to have a splice, at a splice in the video. And this also brings me to this website, which I'm going to do a free shout out, pixabay.com. The first upload I did of this video contained images I found um, through YouTube. And obviously, I did not uh, know if they were royalty free or not. Um, and uh, somebody owned them. And I quickly realized, wow, that was a huge mistake. Can't do that. Um, so I went looking for stock photography uh, sites. And I started with the big players, whose names I'm not going to mention. And they wanted like between $25 to $200 um, per image or, or up to two images. I think the $200 one was. And being that this whole channel is really my side passion of teaching and, and learning at the same time, and it really doesn't make any money at all right now. Um, I was like, wow, that's really expensive. I, I do not want to spend that kind of money. Um, so I came across this site. I just happened to find them, and I thought, wow, I've got to promote them because they are awesome. It's called Pixabay.com. I did actually, uh, full transparency, did donate some money to them. Great site. They've got all these amazing royalty-free images, which you're going to see in the next uh, coming slides. And um, you can contribute images if you want to contribute royalty-free images. And um, if this site ever takes off and generates any money at all, um, I'll definitely uh, give donations to the artists that took these pictures in the upcoming slides. So again, just want to shout out. Check them out again. They're not sponsoring me. They're not paying me anything. They don't even know I exist probably. But, you know, really, really great site. And I really appreciate uh, what they're doing. So the next upcoming slides now are the pen testing, the black hat, the gray hat, the white hat type material. Why am I putting this out here when we're talking about physical inventory? The reason I'm putting this out here is that you need to, you know, get out. You need to walk. You need to move. Another shout out to Pixabay. This image is from Pixabay. Um, you can't just depend on the software to scan the network into your inventory. You need to audit the results. Go to network printers, go to servers, go to different things and see if they got picked up by the audit. And also, as we'll get into, look around your environment um, because the bad actors will use these types of tools or these techniques and you should be aware of them and um, as we'll get to later, how to uh, prevent them. The first item I want to show you is called the pineapple. Um, it's got a very cute name. It's been around quite a while, actually. Um, this one is from a company called Hack5. is a website. This is the sixth generation of the pineapple. Essentially, what is it? It's an access point. It's an access point that is designed with pre-built software into it to do passive and active attacks on a network and scanning. 
This can be used as a network inventory tool as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> it has multiple uses. You can use it that, that way as well um, if you wanted to. Why do I bring this up? Is because if you see a device like this on your network, on somebody's computer, or mounted on a wall or something, you should be aware that, you know, unless you, if you are the security person for that organization, um, you know, it shouldn't be there. So be, be know that it, know if you see some of this that, that it's definitely of concern. This slide here, the reason I put this up, and again, thank you, Pixabay, um, drop ceilings like this are very common in corporate America. I've encountered them a gazillion times. Um, the reason I bring this up is when I do network audits, pen tests, security audits, um, come in after hours, bring a vacuum cleaner and a ladder and pop a ceiling tile, poke your head up there and take a look and see. And I have had cases where I found, you know, pineapple type devices up there, which were not supposed to be up there. Um, also, a little side note, when you do pop ceiling tiles, make sure you wear gloves and a mask because there's usually giant dust bunnies and, and you know, other archaeological finds up there. Um, bring a good flashlight. I personally use a 2000 lumen um, flashlight. Um, I will, I think it's Felix is the company that makes it. Um, I can put the link in the description later if people are interested. Um, but I would bring a very bright flashlight, do a nice 360 degree turn, look for any antennas, any things in the uh, drop ceiling which should not be there. Um, and again, as with any good auditor, pen tester, or whatnot, um, clean up after yourself. Don't leave any trace. That's why I say bring a little vacuum cleaner. Um, I have my, I do a car detailing, my wife's car and my car on weekends. Um, so I bring the little car detailing vacuum with me. Um, very strong vacuum. It's essentially like a small shop vac, um, hand, you know, you carry it. Um, you know, vacuum everything up, clean everything up. I bring, you know, roll of paper towels, some Windex. Um, and the vacuum and I clean everything. Make sure that the rule of thumb I, I go by is that when you enter a space, you should leave the space and nobody should have known you were there. So literally leave no trace. Vacuum clean, make everything look really, really nice. Now again, coming back to the Wi-Fi pineapple, some other things I want to show you about it to be aware of and this is something I've done, is it's also portable. Um, this is the smaller USB version of it, as you see on the left. There's the Hack 5 tactical bag. Um, this bag actually sells on their website for like $60. No offense, Hack 5. That is really overpriced. Um, you, I picked one up through a website called wish.com, where it's kind of like the Amazon of China. I think I picked one up delivered for 20 bucks, and it was pretty much the same bag. Um, missing the little Velcro pineapple and the little Velcro Hack 5 logo, but you can pick these things up for much less. So, you know, unless you want to pay $60, you're welcome to do so, um, but I wouldn't recommend it. On the very right is the smaller holder for it. Um, where this comes in handy, is as you can see here, here's somebody wearing it on the side of a bag. At the very bottom, you'll see a little USB connection that's going to a wireless battery. So um, those of you who are familiar with war driving, there's also war walking. Um, this is a great uh, pen testing tool is to, while you're testing the physical security, you're also testing, you know, you can also do war walking. Why do I bring this up on the inventory part is because the base, the goal of our network inventory is to find things in the network that aren't supposed to be there. And this comes where you want to ideally have a system in place where you're actively monitoring, you know, either through log files or through actual active scanning, what devices are on your network at any set point in time. So if somebody does enter your network with a Wi-Fi pineapple or they try and put a Wi-Fi pineapple in the drop ceiling, you can detect it and know, hey, this should not be on my network and you can block it access or you can even better find out where it is. So be aware these things exist. The rubber ducky, and I don't mean this, and also this exact, this image also comes from the Pixabay. Um, the rubber ducky is a great little tool. It looks like a USB drive. Um, this more comes into play with um, when you're walking around the network, when uh, the the area, I mean, not the network, and you're looking at things. Look for things in USB drives. You know, things that shouldn't be there. 
Um, the rubber ducky is a payload injection tool. It's based on a very simple language called DuckyScript. Um, if you guys are interested, I can do another video on DuckyScript. Um, but I'm showing you these tools so that you know they exist. They, they are out there. They are very fairly easy to use. The learning curve is pretty uh, short. Um, I do have in the pipeline some videos, which I'll probably go into more detail on the ducky and, and the land turtle and some other tools as well and how to use them. And um, again, the point of these videos is educational, guys, not for any of you to go and use this in a malicious manner, but I think and really believe that education is the greatest uh, defense against the bad actors, is you to learn and know what they're using so you can counter it. Um, the land turtle, again, Pixabay, thank you very much, cute little turtle picture. Um, the land turtle is looks like this, and the reason land turtle is so dangerous is, as you can see, if you're not careful, if you just look at, oh, you, most people think, oh, I'm, we're hardwired. We don't have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is disabled. If we see Wi-Fi in the network, we know to shut it down. Well, this is a RJ45 uh, attack vector. Um, as you can see, it just pops in the USB port. You plug in your Ethernet cable on the RJ45, and you're good to go. Remote access. Network intelligence, man in the middle, lots and lots of attack vectors you can use this tool for. And again, this is where a sneaker net comes into play. Go, look, see what's on your network, physically look behind computers. Don't just depend on the discovery tool to scan your network and tell you what's on it. Where the whole point of this step is to build a baseline of what's on your network. And in this tool's case, actually, the problem with this tool from a security perspective is that computer still shows up on your network. You're not going to be able to tell there's a land turtle on it. So this is where we're going to get into the employee education, all that, but be aware of that. This was another example of a tool that existed a while ago. DARPA uh, co-funded it. Um, I believe this was back in the late 90s or, or late 80s, early 90s. It looks like a power strip, but it really contained a 3G GSM adapter. It was also similar to the land turtle, but a little little concealed thing. Um, the reason I bring this up, and no, it's no longer, no longer available on the market, um, is that anybody can take a power strip. You can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, whatever hardware store you have. You can buy a larger, chunky power strip like this or jump on eBay and get a used one. And you can then open it, gut it, toss in a Raspberry Pi, and you're golden. You, you can essentially build your own uh, land turtle with this. Or even if you get a Raspberry Pi, you can use a USB port to actually add the land turtle to it, whatever you want to do. But you could easily, as you can see, uh, you could fit in an SSD drive. You can fit in a Raspberry Pi. You can fit in a land turtle, and you've got literally... Your power source is right there. You don't have to worry about plugging it in because the power strip is the, the, the attack vector. Um, again, be aware of things. Um, if you are an organization, I personally have recommended many organizations standardize the power strips you use or use the very thin, low profile power strips that have no room to stuff a Raspberry Pi or anything else into it. Um, standardize things as much as possible. Don't have this ad hoc letting people just bring from home power strips or whatever they might need. Be, be aware of what's on your network. So the inventory, active and passive scan also get out there and look. You never know what's wrong in the network. This is another item I came across and I was just blown away by it. As you remember in this slide here, $1,300, this DARPA funded power strip. And yes, there can be so many jokes about what happens when the military gets involved in developing things. They wanted $1,300 for this bulky power strip. Here's a little computer from China for $99. So you guys can joke away at it, and I agree completely. Um, another example, this thing, you literally plug it in the wall. It looks like a power brick. It's got USB. It's got Cat5. Um, it's called the Shiva plug. It runs Linux, you can put Linux on it, multiple Linux distributions will fit. It's even got gigabit ethernet, so it means actually it should be Cat 6, I don't know why they wrote Cat 5. Uh, USB 2.0, you 
it's got 512 megs of RAM and 512 megs of flash, plus it has a SD card slot, so you can toss in like 128 gig, 256 gig, even a terabyte SD card, and you can imagine you can do a lot of, of attack vectors from a little device like this. I mean, how easy do you think it would be if you're a pen tester to get in a network, plug this in some outlet somewhere, and run an ethernet cable, and bam, you're good to go. Again, but if you're monitoring your network, when this device tries to get a DHCP address, or if it's hard-coded with an address that somehow the pen tester had gotten, you would see, hey, I don't recognize this device. This is why the, this inventory phase is so important, but it's also important that you don't just depend on what the software tells you. Get, get out there, audit. I mean, ideally, I mean, look, perfect world, I would audit every single Ethernet port, every outlet in your entire premises. Is this realistic? Probably not. To be perfectly honest, it probably isn't very realistic. You can't really do it, depending on the size of your organization. Some organizations have satellite offices. They're enormous. It would be unfeasible, both manpower-wise and both um, cost-wise, to really audit everything completely. So what do you do? How do you solve such an insurmountable problem? The answer is to teach your employees and everybody to be aware and share. If they see something, they don't know what it is or they're not sure if it should be there, everybody's got a smartphone, guys. Tell them, take a picture, text it to the security department. We'll figure it out. You know, every organization that I've contracted for, I always say there are no such thing as a stupid question, just stupid answers. So ask, you want to drill into everybody's head, you are our first line of defense. And a lot of security people I know will uh, joke that, you know, it's a problem between the keyboard and the chair. People are the weakest link of security, social engineering, yada, yada, yada. And that's true. We are the weakest link. Social engineering is the most, believe it or not, unlike Hollywood, social engineering is the most common attack vector most hackers will use. Phishing, spear phishing, there are going to be more videos coming up I'll do about social engineering and, and things like that. But in general, yeah, we people are the most vulnerable and we're also the best defense against attack vectors. So with your physical inventory, Teach your employees to know what is in their cubicle, what is in their office. Oh, I have a laptop. Okay, how many things are plugged into its USB port? Well, I have a mouse and a keyboard. Okay, one day they come in their office, their cable locked laptop has three things plugged into USB ports. And they'll sit there and go, wait, that's strange. I didn't have three things yesterday. What is different? You know, like Sesame Street, what has changed? What is, what, what is different in these things? Take a picture, shoot it over. Oh, somebody dropped a land turtle on one of my USB ports. Or there's a weird USB drive stuck out of my port with a picture of a little duck on it. Little, you cannot underestimate the importance and the value of educating everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. And I don't mean just the people who you see in the office from 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 or 8 to 7, whatever. Also, and this is often overlooked, educate the people who come to clean the office at night because they are focused on cleaning. And, and I, I always tell people, never, ever underestimate anybody. Never take anybody for granted, regardless of what their job title is or how much they make an hour or a day or their salary, anything. Treat everybody equally. Teach that cleaning crew, hey, if you see something strange, Take a picture and text it to me. I don't care if it's 2 in the morning or 4 in the morning. Text it to me because you'd be amazed how many pen testing friends I have who have gotten jobs as the cleaning crew at night in order to get different types of mechanisms within that organization for pen testing purposes. So there's lots of attack vectors into an organization and... If you educate everyone involved in your organization as much as possible to be aware and share and never, ever tell them, wow, that was a stupid question. No, you tell them, thank you for that question. I'm going to look into that. 
it will help a lot. It will help a lot. And the best part is this type of education is going to make your, invent your inventory maintenance much easier. And it's going to make your entire organization much more secure. Now, here's another example of what else you can do. This is called a USB port lock. This is an example of a Kensington model. What it is, is kind of what it sounds like. It locks the USB port. It prevents anything from physically getting into that USB port. This is another example from a company called Smart Keeper. Now, guys, again, full transparency, I'm not being paid by Kensington or Smart Keeper. I'm simply showing you this technology exists. If you want to implement it in your organization, that's your prerogative, your choice, obviously. You can also disable USB ports on the software level. Um, some, sometimes in the BIOS level, too, they offer. Um, you just have to decide what your organization wants to do and the level of security and what type of information is on those computers. But this is certainly an option. Uh, Smart Keeper has, as you can see, there's optical disk drive guards, there's um, SD port locks, there's all sorts of different things you can lock out of the machines. Now this last one might look extreme, but believe it or not, I have encountered this in my contract work. Um, some organizations will do this. Um, if it's a desktop computer, they will USB the USB keyboard into the port. So they'll stick the keyboard in the USB port, the cable in, and then we'll put a big old blob of USB around that USB cable so the keyboard is literally like stuck to the computer. Um, and then any open USB ports, they'll actually just put a blob of, US, of uh, super glue gel into that port, and that USB port is now rendered completely useless. Extreme example? Absolutely. Is it a really cheap solution to preventing people from putting USB uh, drives into computers? Absolutely. This costs pennies, and it is ridiculously effective. Will it destroy the USB port? It, it's like the, the poor man's solution. So anyway, that concludes this video. Um, thank you. Please like and share, subscribe, push the little bell icon. Leave a little blur, but again, a shout out to Pixabay. Thank you guys. Your images are awesome. All of you guys, please give them a visit. Give them a little bit of money, a donation if you want. Um, great, great site. I think the concept they're doing of free, royalty-free images, community-driven, um, is absolutely amazing. And I definitely um, do do some, some photography on the side also, and I'm going to start to upload some of my own images there uh, for people to have royalty-free because I think that's just an awesome, awesome idea because uh, some of these other sites are charging just ridiculous amounts of money for all two free images and I think it's really kind of crazy so okay thank you everybody and I will talk to you in the next video